It's unclear when, exactly, NASA's $1.5 billion Parker Solar Probe will be incinerated by the heat of the sun's corona. By the time that happens, it will have traveled faster and closer to the sun than any man-made object before it. Maybe most importantly, though, Parker could help prevent massive electrical blackouts unlike anything Earth has seen before. In the midst of this historic undertaking, you'll find Justin Casper, a principal investigator on the Parker mission and a climate and space science professor at Michigan Engineering. In this episode, re-engineering radio's Jim Lynch will explain what went into the probe's launch. And later, he's joined by Casper to see what we've learned in the year since. Re-engineering radio is brought to you by University of Michigan Engineering, where we challenge the status quo to serve the common good. When we talk about solar weather, we're talking about electromagnetic activity in the sun's atmosphere that could cause major disturbances on Earth. And when we talk about disturbances, we're talking about the potential to knock out huge swaths of our electrical grids for months or even years at a time. That threat is among the driving forces behind NASA's Parker Solar Probe, which launched in early August of 2018. No bigger than the Chevy Malibu in your driveway, there's a lot of responsibility riding on this tiny probe's frame. Twisting, fiery solar flares caused by strong magnetic fields on the surface of the sun shoot up from the star, pushing radiation up and out into space. According to Casper, these large coronal mass ejections could release an amount of plasma or radiation into the solar atmosphere that's roughly equal to the volume of water in Lake Michigan. All of that happens at speeds of about 3 million miles per hour in tens of minutes. It's an incredible amount of energy. When that energy reaches Earth, it has the capacity to wreak havoc. Most vulnerable are our electrical system's massive transformers. Because they're custom-made at a cost of tens of millions of dollars apiece, there are no spares. And because they can take up to six months to manufacture, a major failure could have lasting consequences. Our current early warning system for such threats comes from two sources. Combined, they provide us with roughly one hour of warning. That's potentially enough to take precautions to protect power grids. It's good for now, but NASA believes the data gathered by the Parker Solar Probe mission could eventually lead to an early warning system that gives us several days' advance notice. There are reasons we've never sent a spacecraft as close to the sun as the Parker Solar Probe will get in the coming years. Chief among them is this. You don't spend $1.5 billion to send something across the galaxy just to burn up before it can tell you anything useful. Proving that the sensors, solar panels, and other key equipment on board would survive the heat and light of this trip was a key hurdle ahead of launch. Getting to that point, though, required a little bit of networking and a lot of ingenuity, Casper will tell you. Years ago, long before the Parker mission was approved, he remembers telling colleagues that he thought the idea for the mission would work. In response to his remarks, and with few details provided, a colleague invited Casper to meet him at a small town in France's southern region called Perpignan. Months later, when Casper was in Rome for a meeting, he caught a short flight to meet his colleague in the French city, touching down in shorts and sandals that fit the day's beautiful weather. After a brief greeting, the pair headed off in a car, destination still unknown for Casper. Three hours later, way up in the Pyrenees Mountains, Casper, in the same sandals and shorts, got out of the car, stepping miserably into a half foot of snow. And looking up, he saw the largest solar furnace in the world. The Odiu Solar Furnace is a massive 177 by 157 foot collection of mirrors designed to follow the sun's movements and constantly reflect its rays. Atop the curved wall of mirrors are two water-cooled doors opening on a vacuum chamber that houses a particle accelerator. It's all designed to study how materials respond to extreme heat, and Casper came prepared. Ahead of the trip, his colleagues told him to bring a prototype of his instrument to test in the chamber. They exposed it to the full amount of sunlight it would experience at its closest approach to the sun, simultaneously hitting it with the same level of radiation it will experience from the solar atmosphere. Best of all, they told Casper... They do it for free. Such offers don't come along every day, even for those who research solar weather. So, it all left Casper baffled. In response to his head scratching, Casper's new best friend shared a memorandum that was signed in the 1970s by members of France's National Center for Space Studies. In it, officials had long ago pledged their assistance in the pursuit of making a solar probe a reality. Their end of the bargain was to provide the testing environment to prove materials could withstand the sun's heat. Casper says, apparently, they'd been waiting for 40 years for someone to show up and say, okay, I've got it, where do I plug it in? Fast forward to last year. A key component of Casper's sensory equipment, Parker's Faraday Cup, 
had to be shown capable of withstanding the heat and light of the journey to the sun. The cup is designed to scoop up the solar wind, measuring the electrons, protons, and helium ions it contains, as well as their velocity, density, and temperatures. To test it, researchers had to create something new, a homemade sun simulator. Their creation took shape in a first-floor lab at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It had the look of a makeshift operating room with a metal frame holding up thick blue tarps around three sides to create a 16 by 8 foot workspace. Inside the area, recreating the sun's heat and light fell to a quartet of modified older model IMAX projectors that Casper's team purchased on eBay for a few thousand dollars a piece. These are not the digital machines you find in today's cineplexes, but an earlier generation that utilized bulbs. It turns out a movie theater bulb on an IMAX projector runs at about 5,700 degrees Kelvin, the same effective temperature as the surface of the sun, and it gives off nearly the same spectrum of light as the surface. Space offers essentially no atmosphere, meaning a proper testing environment for the Faraday cup would have as little air as possible. So, researchers placed the cup in a metal vacuum chamber for testing. Resembling an iron lung, the seven-foot-long silver chamber has a hatch at one end that swings outward with a small round window in it. The night before testing, the team began pumping atmosphere out of the vacuum chamber. By the time the simulation was ready, the chamber registered roughly one billionth of the Earth's atmosphere. A final feature of the simulator was its ability to generate the kind of particles the Faraday cup will need to sense and evaluate. To do that, the team attached an ion gun to the vacuum tube hatch with a barrel of the device reaching inside and pointed at the cup. On test day, the Faraday cup took the heat and delivered, putting Parker's solar probe on track for its summer launch. Sure, going to the sun and gathering data that will protect Earth is Parker's mission, but why not break some records along the way? To get the data researchers need, the probe will need to get close to the sun, closer than any other man-made object before it. At its closest pass through the solar corona, Parker is expected to come within 3.8 million miles of the surface. That might not sound like a close encounter, but it's over seven times closer than the previous man-made record holder, which was 27 million miles from the sun's surface. Just after Parker cruises by Mercury, it will pass by Helios II, the current record holder. But Parker won't be done making history at that point. The probe will make multiple passes through the corona, but to get close to the sun, Parker is going to need a little energy from Venus, utilizing seven gravity assists to bring its orbits closer and closer to the sun. Each gravity assist lowers the perihelion until it eventually closes within 10 solar radii of the sun in 2025. During its final passes, Parker is expected to reach a velocity of 430,000 miles per hour, almost doubling Helios 2's previous record of just over 220,000 miles per hour. That pace would get you from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. in one second, or New York to London in 28 seconds. It's weird and totally counterintuitive. You would expect temperatures to cool as you move away from the 10,340 degree Fahrenheit surface of a burning ball of gas but the corona can get up to 1,000 times hotter than the surface of the sun. The extreme conditions of the corona are one of the main reasons a solar probe mission like this hasn't been undertaken before. It simply wasn't possible, but Parker features a series of innovations that will allow the probe to get close enough to do what needs to be done. Key among these is the probe's heat shield, a 4.5-inch thick plate of carbon foam that will sit 3 meters away from the craft's most sensitive equipment. Its front is covered by synthetic sapphire crystals across its 8-foot diameter to help survive temperatures of up to 1,600 degrees Celsius and 5 megawatts of light. Meanwhile, behind the shield, temperatures will remain at just a few hundred degrees. To run all of the equipment protected by the shield, any self-respecting solar probe would utilize solar power, right? But for Parker, that was impossible, since solar panels quite literally couldn't handle the heat. But Parker's engineers made it work. After launch, the probe unfolded a pair of long solar panels to each side for power. Their conductors, capable of handling the extreme heat and light of the mission, are a relatively new creation. Yet even far away from the sun, those panels need cooling, and the probe provides an elegantly simple solution. It pumps water from behind the panels to an area in the shade of the heat shield, where it cools quickly before being sent back to the panels. Casper says the coolant system works much like the radiator in a car engine. 
As Parker draws closer to the sun, circulation will no longer do the trick. To offset the rising heat, the probe will draw in its solar panels behind the shield. Those panels are designed with slanted ends that allow a small portion to stick out from behind the shield and continue powering the craft. NASA's Parker Solar Probe may literally end in a blaze of glory. Over the course of its seven-year journey, Parker will travel back and forth between Venus and the Sun for seven gravity assists, capturing data that can protect the Earth from dangerous solar weather. Those assists will lead to a total of 24 orbits around the Sun. But Parker's mission and the probe itself will eventually end. The clock on the probe will start ticking when it runs out of the fuel used to make attitude adjustments. Pressure from the Sun will flip the probe around and the entire backside will be incinerated in seconds. Some of the probe, like the carbon heat shield, Faraday cup, and some other parts should survive the high temperatures, even when the rest of Parker burns up. While a burst of flames might not sound like a great way to end a $1.5 billion NASA mission, Parker's data collection can protect the United States from catastrophic solar weather and answer a few century-old questions along the way. We'll be right back in 20 seconds. Just wanted to know if you like the podcast so far. This is a new medium for the University of Michigan Engineering crew, so if you have any ideas or feedback, please email engineeringpod at umich.edu. That's engineeringpod at umich.edu. And now, back to Jim with his first question for Justin Casper, a principal investigator for the Parker Solar Probe. What's the potential damage that a super flare could pose to us here? Well, I'll, I'll wow you with the worst case scenario. About 150 years ago, there was a very large event. <clears throat> we call it the Carrington event because it was observed, uh, amongst other people, by uh, an astronomer named Carrington. And uh, he saw a solar flare that was so intense he could actually see it in visible light. Um, and then about 18 hours later, something that was flung off the sun from that explosion slammed into Earth. And it made magnetic compasses wiggle around. Um, it created uh, northern lights that was so intense it was seen all the way down into the Bahamas. Um, and telegraph lines started sparking and catching on fire. And in fact, the telegraph system was down for about three days. Ballpark me as to what year this would have been? Uh, 1859. Okay, so you're talking about a society at the time that is far less reliant on its technology it was, than we are today. It was like the, the internet of the time. It was the Victorian internet, if you would. But yes, we weren't, we weren't quite addicted to it yet. Um, there were definitely, in, in the U.S., for example, um, it turns out a lot of people thought this was a, a foreboding signal that the Civil War was going to break out in the United States. The problem today is we are far more dependent on communications and technology in space than I think a lot of people realize. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Most grocery stores or companies that operate in cities have maybe a, a day's worth of inventory. That could be food, that could be medicine. Uh, and so they rely on like just-in-time logistics to ship material around. You've got a database, you've got your warehouses, bring more lettuce here, you know, bring penicillin to this uh, drugstore. Uh, this all uses GPS for timing uh, and for navigation in order to work. Uh, and then if it's perishable food, it needs electricity for refrigeration, et cetera, et cetera. So what's happened in the last uh, decade is different countries, the U.S., uh, the United Kingdom, have done these war game simulations where they go, well, what if the Carrington event happened today? And the projections in the worst case are something like every city on the east and west coasts of the U.S. loses power for a couple of years. A couple of years. Couple now, that's, years. tell our listeners about why that is. This is a great example of one of those things where the, the scientists and the engineers go, ooh, that's cool. And then it's like, yeah, but could also end civilization, so... <laughs> Let's treat it with some respect. So if you've ever wondered how uh, or looked at how an electric uh, generator works, you basically sweep a magnet over a wire. And when you sweep that magnet across the wire, it makes a current flow. Uh, and that's really the way, the only way we generate electrical power is we, uh, we spin magnets over wires. So when the sun gives off one of these massive eruptions, it emits this really fast moving chunk of magnetized material that could be a fraction of the solar system across by the time it reaches Earth. So 
basically during the Carrington event, you have the equivalent of a giant magnet being rubbed across Earth for a couple days. Uh, and so that makes huge currents fly in telegraph lines back then. Today it would be in power lines, oil pipelines, uh, other things. And so one of the things we're at great risk for is all of those giant high voltage power transformers. You ever go driving around and you see those really high voltage power lines that transport power from the power plants out to cities. And then at the end of that, there's always like some giant hulking structure hidden behind some trees with like a big transformer. And what that does is it steps down that high voltage and the voltage that we use in our homes. And the problem is those big transformers, they can handle a ton of power but only power that's oscillating. They can't really uh, handle a lot of uh, just steady current flowing through them. And normally there is no steady current flowing through. But if you have a solar storm pass over Earth, it can just push a current through that thing, overheat the transformer, and just cause it the, the oil in it to boil, the, the um, uh, metal to eventually short out. The effect is kind of like a, an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse. It's very similar to an electromagnetic pulse. Um, if you're talking about a human-made electromagnetic pulse, like a nuclear weapon... I'm talking about the things that I see in action movies. Yeah. Um, then, yes, it would be equivalent... It's as scientific as I get. It would be equivalent to like the late phase uh, of uh, detonating a nuclear weapon. The problem with this is across the entire planet... Um, there are a handful of companies that have the capacity to manufacture maybe one of these transformers a year. So if you lost a thousand of them, um, you're in big trouble. I mean, we wouldn't like we wouldn't throw our hands up and say, oh, well, I guess we've got to wait 500 years. I mean, people would spring up companies and we'd scavenge for electrical wiring. Uh, but the entire time we're trying to do this, potentially you don't have electricity in these cities. And um, former head of FEMA pointed out, one of the problems is when we're used to most, in most natural disasters, if a hurricane hits part of the U.S., it impacts a finite part of the country. So you get in your cars, and even if it takes a few days, you know, you can go from Louisiana to Texas and, you know, wait until we've recovered. One of the problems that's come up in these war games is, you know, if it takes out all the power in the United Kingdom, there's nowhere to, drive there's nowhere to. to go. So... After the first day, they were starting to run out of food. By the second day, communications broke down. By the fifth day, it was like the zombie apocalypse. Uh, and so that's a very extreme example of what we're worried about. But, but it is, um, unfortunately, a real possibility. Explain to me where Parker fits into the whole, the whole picture here. We've got a threat that originates in the corona and can cause all sort of damage here, lower level, higher level. What is it that Parker is doing there that's going to allow us to deal with that situation? Well, let's compare the space weather situation today with our regular weather situation today. So hurricane season starting. So if a hurricane begins to form in the Atlantic Ocean right now, we'll know within hours, right? We have geosynchronous spacecraft, that spacecraft orbiting over the uh, Atlantic Ocean that, that take images constantly. Uh, if, a, if a circulation pattern begins to set up, we know immediately if it moves towards the East Coast, we get updates. You know, we get those every day, like every, um, you know, on the nightly news, they'll show you the track we think it's taking and whether it's gotten stronger and, you know, whether it's starting to dissipate or not, right? Um, so for, for modern weather on Earth, uh, we're able to track these storms as they progress. Right now what happens when there's a solar eruption is you can see like a big solar flare, so like a flash of x-rays and light at the surface of the sun. Sometimes you see a blob come flying out uh, right after that uh, explosion. And then people look at the shape of the blob and go, you know, <clears throat> was that heading sideways or did it look like it was heading towards us? Right. And then nothing. Because we have no way of tracking it after a certain distance. Well, so if a storm crosses the Discover spacecraft, and we start to see like speeds rise, temperatures rise, uh, we get that real-time warning. Um, the problem is, for a fast event, it then hits Earth about 20 minutes later. So 20 minutes lead time. Yeah, which really, you know, is 20 minutes. We had a, uh, there was a Senate hearing on this a couple months ago, and um, I didn't realize this. It turns out the Secretary of Energy is empowered to 
uh, command all the U.S. utilities to power down. Um, is 20 minutes really enough time for them to make an informed decision about that? You know, shutting down the U.S. power grid would result in, in potentially many fatalities at hospitals, who knows where else, right? That's a weighty decision to make. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not even really sure how you turn our grid back on since most of our uh, procedures involve reach out to part of the grid that's still working and borrow some power from them. Um, so, um, yeah, it's a big problem today that we don't have, uh, we just have this massive gap <laughs> where we're just waiting to see what happens. By being inside the sun's corona for the first time and the instrumentation that you're overseeing, having the opportunity to collect data directly, yeah. how is that going to translate to our better preparation or better understanding of solar weather? Absolutely. Think again of a hurricane. All right. All right. We know a lot about the Atlantic Ocean. We monitor its temperature. We know how waves travel through it. So when we see a hurricane start forming, we have these ever more accurate models, and they've gotten a lot better over the last couple decades, that can predict which way it's headed and, and whether it's going to strengthen or weaken. Imagine trying to do that today, only you've never measured how the temperature or the speed varies with distance from the sun. Right? We don't have any data above about 10 solar radii or so. We can't even take really images and detect anything. So we have the best uh, guess models of what the environment is like, what kind of waves there are, how hot things are, how fast waves travel, but it's all speculative. So Solar Probe will provide the first just direct measurements of this is the speed of the waves. You know, this is how hot things actually uh, are. And if we don't know those, like we, we can't really blame our models when they don't correctly uh, predict how long it takes a shockwave to travel through that space. So uh, the Parker Solar Probe takes off in August 2018. Mm. It's not your first launch, right? Nope. You've been involved with a few others. Mm. This is special, though, in a way for you. Isn't it the role that you're playing on this one? It's my first time as principal investigator for a big suite. It's definitely the largest mission I've ever worked on, too. I'd watched launches where I'd had a lot of friends and I know they'd spent five or six years working on this project. In this case, uh, when we were getting ready to launch, you know, in some sense, like a quarter of the sensors on the spacecraft are ones I'm responsible for. Uh, And then my team has been working on this for about 10 years now. Uh, So that's a, that's a pretty large effort that we've invested into this. So one, you, you, know, you want it to get up into space because of all the time we've invested in it. Um, and then actually the biggest surprise for me was, uh, yes, the rocket taking off was awesome. I mean, it's a Delta IV Heavy is a, is a real sight to behold and it lit up the whole sky at night and it was amazing. It was so clear that night we were actually able to see the stage burn until it burned out like three minutes after launch. Wow. Yeah, it was incredible. And I felt no closure. I was just, so it's surprised. It's just the start for you. It's just point. the start. I was like, but now I've got to wait a month until we make contact and start commissioning the instruments. And it's wonderful that the rocket worked, but that's not my responsibility. Um, so I thought, you know, it would get off the launch pad and I'd be like, well, okay, there we go. Job well done. And instead, you know, like just nothing. So, uh, uh, it was very interesting waiting waiting that month. We had to wait a while for um, basically any any contamination to evaporate. Uh, and then the spacecraft had a very precise routine of commissioning it had to go through before they could power on the instruments. There is a certain sort of thing you keep your eye on when you're in charge of instrumentation where mm-hmm. they switched everything on for the first time. Yeah. When was that and how did that go? Well, so... We had to wait a few days. The spacecraft uses water uh, to cool off its solar panels at closest approach. Um, And the water gets pumped through radiators uh, to to dissipate that heat. If we just launched with the radiators full of water, they would have frozen and shattered. So they have to spin the spacecraft, heat up each of the radiators, pump them full of water in this like intricate ballet uh, over a few days. Um, And then... We very briefly powered up our instrument suite to open the doors on some of our instruments had, had doors that stayed closed until after launch to prevent contamination from getting in. So 
uh, a few days after that, we had a very brief contact um, where we turned on like the computer that controls our instrument suite. It was like, hey there. Like <laughs> exact same response as when we were on the ground, which was kind of weird. Yeah. Um, and then we commanded it to open all the doors, which doesn't always work. So it was very nice when that happened. And then that was it. We had to wait uh, basically uh, another three weeks before we could do anything again. You it's, have to wait weeks, basically. You have to before. wait weeks. So wow. imagine, imagine now like a, a, a timeline, a spreadsheet where every 15 minutes is booked for an activity 24-7 for weeks before you get to get in the queue. For me, it was a very bizarre uh, situation because it always works out like this. I had my precious vacation in Maine that I'd been looking forward to for so long uh, winds up being exactly when we turn on the instruments. And so uh, I will never forget this. It was like, you know, wonderful day at the beach. Everyone goes to bed. One in the morning, I slip on my headphones, connect into our operations center, which is tied into like the overall spacecraft operations center. And the way NASA talks to deep space missions and by the way, you might be thinking, well, you know, deep space, like it only launched like three weeks earlier. Um, this is the fastest object ever to leave Earth. Um, so even by three weeks, it was uh, an appreciable distance towards Venus. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're at that point using these massive 70 meter dishes that NASA has around the world in three locations. And so in just outside of Canberra, Australia, this big 70 meter dish turns and points at the spacecraft and we tell it like, and so basically once NASA establishes the connection, we do the commanding to talk to our instruments. So our instrument scientists were literally like, okay, wake up and boom, like our computer immediately responded. Well, not immediately responded. It was a couple minutes. I was like travel ask you, time. What's the lag time on that? It was, a, it was a couple minutes at that point. Um, so a couple minutes later, okay, it's uh, awake. And then uh, we turned on our instruments one at a time. And the really big surprise was like, okay, so they're all working, the high voltage is on, they're stepping through like internal calibrations and tests and, and reporting the results back to us. And we've moved on from the solar probe cup, which is the what's supposed to be the sun-pointed instrument. But during this commissioning phase, we were actually, the spacecraft was sort of tilted 45 degrees away from the sun, basically keeping those radiators warm so they don't freeze up. Uh, and so the solar wind was, if there was any solar wind at all, it was coming into our instrument at this huge angle. So we, we weren't going to see anything, or at least we weren't counting on it. And, and then at like 2.30 in the morning, uh, one of our instrument scientists, Tony Case, goes, you know, wait, hold on a second. Like the solar probe cup's reporting it's tracking the solar wind. It's like, yeah, I mean, it's it's bidding out like totally plausible numbers for density and temperature. And we're like, what's going on? And this gust of solar wind had decided to blow in at an angle. A different angle. Yeah, and it, it came into the cup and suddenly we saw like the solar wind appear. So you got an early test of how the cup performed. Yeah, and learned that it's incredibly sensitive compared to how insensitive it had to be. Um, so it was it was pretty stunning that it was detecting a signal at those large angles uh, and that far from the sun, um, meaning that as we've gotten closer to the sun in our actual designed operating uh, range, we've been making really, really nice measurements. Basically, things went so smoothly, uh, we started taking data shortly after that. So at this point, the first time you're getting this information back, mm -hmm. you said it's where you just passed which planet? Venus. All right. How many solar radii are you away from the sun at that point? I have no idea. Are you actually doing the math? You're doing the math on your phone, aren't you? Yeah, I'm trying to. Yeah, I just haven't thought about Venus in a while. 0.7 astronomical units. Yeah, that's right. So uh, the closest anything had really gotten in before was about the orbit of Mercury, which is at 0.4 astronomical units. That's the distance with one astronomical unit, mm -hmm. the distance between the Sun and the Earth. So we were at about 0.7 astronomical units. We went past Venus. Um, and then in uh, right around Halloween, uh, we started our first encounter with the Sun. So at about Halloween, we dipped below a quarter of an astronomical unit. 
Um, and then around November 4th, we had our closest uh, approach to the sun. That first approach, right around Halloween, mm -hmm. the first time you guys have orbited the sun, mm -hmm. did that automatically make Parker Solar Probe the closest man-made object to the sun? So that was, you'd already, you'd already made history by that point, I think right around yep. the time you passed Mercury. Yep, exactly. But this was the big record setter for... We basically, we basically sep uh, celebrated a, a few records on that inbound phase. So closest spacecraft to the sun, closest approach to the sun, and I think we also uh, hit fastest object ever. Fastest uh, man-made object ever. Yes. Okay. 90 kilometers per second was our uh, maximum speed around the sun for that first encounter. By the time Parker's done with its planned mission, you're going to have how many perihelions? 25 orbits in the primary mission, uh, about five gravitational assists, and uh, we'll wind up. So this first encounter, we got... 35 solar radii away from the sun, uh, and the final ones will be below 10 solar radii from the sun. About those last few perihelions, will the record speed that you've created will be faster by that time? Yep. Um, we'll be moving at about 180 kilometers per second. How are you supposed to collect data when you're moving through it, whatever that last number was you just threw at me? Ah, that's a great question. So one of the things that's really interesting about Solar Probe is Right now, we're relatively far from the sun, and we're making the fastest measurements ever made in the solar wind. Um, and, and things look fascinating. And we're going to be able to do a lot of really interesting science by being able to see how things change faster than anyone's ever been able to study it before. We, we see waves people have never seen before, all sorts of interesting structure. Um, one thing we have to remind everyone about scientists who want to look at the data is unfortunately the fastest measurements ever made when we're tearing through the sun's atmosphere at like almost 200 kilometers a second will probably be like just fast enough to see what's going on right so uh you're absolutely right that the closer you get to the sun the magnetic field is stronger densities are higher temperatures are higher things are just happening faster and so we hope that the cadences we have are good enough to keep up but um you know, the fastest angle the solar wind's flowing at, for instance, has ever been measured, I think, was about 30 times a second. And uh, during the first encounter, we were measuring how the wind was flapping around about 300 times a second and, and saw interesting things. One of the things that Parker is meant to do is to go there and help us understand why the strange heating occurs. The further mm -hmm. you get away from the sun, it just gets hotter instead mm -hmm. of what you would expect it to be, hotter at the, near the surface. Talk to me a little bit about the, the puzzle first. As to what's the puzzle here that you're hoping to get some answers to? Right. So what, this big puzzle and the first objective of our suite in the spacecraft is to figure out how the corona is being heated. And people often talk about like uh, the coronal heating problem. And that, that term, I feel, is really an umbrella term for a bunch of issues. Uh, one is just the overall temperature goes from like 6,000 degrees at the surface of the sun, which is why the surface of the sun glows yellow. Uh, when you're out in the corona, temperatures rise to half a million, a million degrees or so. But it's worse than that. Ions are hotter than electrons. So whatever is heating the corona heats ions more than electrons, which we don't really understand. Now, this is the only place, I think you've mentioned me in the past, this is the only place where we've ever seen that, where there are different elements that are heated to different temperatures. Usually it's uniform. Yeah. There's some evidence with uh, X-ray, astrophysical X-ray observatories that are around black holes and in supernova shocks that maybe things are at different temperatures. Um, but it's very hard to measure that precisely from you know, a million light years away. So this would be the, the closest look we've gotten at this type of this, preferential this kind heating. Of preferential heating. That's you described right. it as preferential heating simply yeah. because different elements are getting to different Yeah, exactly. So that's the, the final element of the mystery for me is it's not just that ions are hotter, but like heavier ions are a lot hotter. So like, let's look specifically at something like oxygen or iron. Um, by the time you're a couple solar radii above the surface of the sun, they might be at a temperature of like 80 to 100 million degrees. That's three times hotter than the core of the sun. Um, so something is really superheating uh, these heavier ions. Now, that alone is a valuable piece of information because it tells us something about 
whatever the physics is that's happening. Uh, it can't just be some overall wave that's heating everything equally. Uh, it's something that cares about like the mass and the charge of the particles. Uh, but we don't know exactly what it is. Theory agnostic, here's why I'm excited. So people have used what's called spectroscopy. So they look at the, UV, the ultraviolet light coming off of the corona and they make these temperature measurements. And by the time you're three or four solar radii away from the sun, there's not enough ultraviolet light to make those measurements anymore. So there's no data until the solar wind reaches Earth and we measure the temperature and we can kind of see um, a residual signal of that, those higher temperatures. A lot of it's gotten washed out in the time it, the solar wind got to us. Okay. So a question I was asked a lot after we were um, agitating for solar probe and then when solar probe was selected was, well, you only get into 10 solar radii. How do you know you're actually going to see this stuff? Because the ultraviolet light only shows the heating happening out to a few solar radii. It's already started. To so paint. like, oh man, like what if, what if you're like close but no cigar, you know, uh, you just didn't get close enough. So this has obviously bothered me. Um, <laughs> and so we were really happy to report last year um, a technique we developed to measure, okay, you can use ultraviolet light to figure out when that heating starts. How far out from the sun does that heating continue? And is that distance going to be uh, far enough away from the sun that probe stands a chance of actually entering that region and seeing that active heating? So maybe that heating goes all the way out to Earth, and we've been observing it for half a century. Maybe it stops at four solar radii, and we're never going to see it directly, or somewhere in between. But you guys have been able to determine. With yes. The, this is what you call your stopwatch approach. Exactly. So we were actually, uh, last year what we reported was, or two years ago now, um, if you look at the leftover temperature differences um, and the rate at which they're getting washed out as uh, the solar wind passes spacecraft near Earth, you can actually use that as a stopwatch to measure how long it's been since they were strongly preferentially heated. And then you know how fast the wind's moving, so you can turn that into a distance. And in our first paper, we were like, look, there's some unknowns here, but we can tell that it's somewhere between like tens and like 50 solar radii so it's not just at the surface um, and it doesn't go all the way and it doesn't earth. go all the way out to earth so we should totally do probe uh, the most recent update that we had makes it look even more exciting what we did was we said what's so special about a point tens of solar radii away from the sun so from a wearing our physics hat we can say like well look there are special distances from the sun where different things happen. So you have a ballpark idea at this point in your in your research. You had a ballpark idea of where you thought the heating stopped. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you start looking into that area and say, okay, what is actually occurring at that point that might be the cause of the heating issue? Exactly. Okay. So when we look at like a normal gas, um, one thing uh, as a gas accelerates... Uh, that you care about is how fast the gas is moving relative to the speed of sound. So when you break the sound barrier or the speed of sound, that's a, a very critical moment, right? Airplanes act very differently if they travel supersonic than subsonic. In the corona, there's an equivalent. Uh, it's not the speed of sound. It's the speed of a special magnetized wave called an alphane wave. And some distance away from the sun, as the wind keeps going faster and faster, we know it accelerates as it moves away from the sun. We also think that this alphane speed actually drops as you get further from the sun. So somewhere it goes super alphanic. And this is a... You're making that word up. No, no. This was uh, Parker, who was the sort of theorist who discovered and predicted the solar wind, um, immediately identified this alphane critical point, he called it, or alphane point. Uh, as a potentially interesting uh, location. And so what's, there are a couple reasons that the Alphane point is interesting. One is if you're a wave, a magnetic wave traveling in the atmosphere, if you're below the Alphane point, you can talk to the surface of the sun and the surface of the sun can send a wave that can reach you. You're in like causal contact with the surface of the sun. Let me see if I can clarify that. So when you say that you're in contact, that means it's if I've understood it correctly, it's bouncing back and it bounces off the surface of the sun and then goes back outward to a certain point and then returns. Exactly. So like if I'm in an, if I'm in an airplane that's traveling uh, below the speed of sound 
and I could shout loud enough, hey, like you'd hear me. Um, if I was in an airplane that was traveling faster than the speed of sound and I shouted, you'd never hear me because that sound wave can't get back to you. Well, the same thing is happening in the solar atmosphere. Uh, below the alphane point, alphane waves can travel in both directions. Once you're above the alphane point, uh, waves can only, they can't ever get back to the surface of the sun. Now, who cares? <laughs> well, I'm assuming you do. I do. So you have posited that this particular point where the alphane waves sort of stop bouncing back and forth from the surface and sort of release off into space, there's something special happening there, and you've sort of pinpointed it to how far from the surface? Right. So this is what was interesting about our work. We took decades of observations of the solar wind taken near Earth, and we just extrapolated back towards the sun. Okay, if the wind accelerates at this rate and the alphane speed changes at this rate, when does the wind go super alphanic? And what we found is the alphane point, and other people have published uh, this phenomenon before, the alphane point seems to move in and out with the level of solar activity. So the sun has an 11 year cycle of solar activity, solar maximum, you have a ton of solar flares. And at solar maximum, the alphane point seems to get out to 25, 30 solar radii. When the sun calms down, it can drop down to like 20, 25 solar radii. The area where the, the alphane activity is going, it sort of breathes in and out around the sun it breathes over in time. And, 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 okay, it's at, by our guesstimates, tens of solar radii, and that's where we thought this heating happened. So what we decided to do was divide up all the data we'd used for our first paper uh, by year and look at how far from the sun this zone of preferential heating extends as a function of time. And to our... Um, pleasant shock, uh, what we found is the outer boundary of this zone of preferential heating moves in lockstep with the location of the alphane point. So when the alphane point moves out, the heating uh, continues further from the sun. When the alphane point contracts, uh, the heating is uh, more concentrated in a smaller region around the sun. So the mystery we've been looking at all this time is the idea of why it heats yes. the further you get away from the sun. And at this point, what you've been able to do is estimate where the heating stops, and you've actually overlaid that with this breathing in and out of the alphane activity. Yes. And so what do you find when you lay them over the top of each other? Well, so what's interesting, and I don't, you know, we're speculating here, but, um, but what's interesting is we know that one of the ways energy is being carried away from the sun and into space is through long wavelength uh, waves, and that those waves eventually get dissipated. So, you know, what do I mean by that? Like, you know, if you look at the ocean, you see a wave, it hits the beach, the wave goes away. Like, that energy went somewhere. It went into heating the sand or something like that. Um, so something must be happening uh, in the sun, too. We see less and less waves as we get further away from the sun. Um, and so one thought is those waves could be heating the plasma. What's interesting is... Uh, if you calculate like how effective a wave is at heating things, if you can set the scenario where waves are traveling in opposite directions at the same time, you supercharge the process. Um, and so you can get phenomenally more heating if you can have waves traveling in both directions. So what's interesting about being below the alphane point is we'd expect to see alphane waves traveling in both directions. Um, and so that's... That's our theory based on the observations that we've seen. Dumb it down for me. Is it as simple as saying that the heating stops where the alphane waves stop bouncing back and forth? Yep. So is it safe to say that you're saying the alphane waves are directly linked to the heating? That would appear to be the case. Yes. All right. Yeah. So what's exciting for us is, you know, take solar probe's trajectory, take projections of where this alphane point is, and we can predict that in about two years, we're going to dip below that surface. Um, and then, hopefully, we'll finally see for the first time this heating in action. And, and what I'd expect to see is alphane waves traveling in both directions, superheated material, and then we can look directly at the waves and say, you know, what, what exact kind of waves are these and, and how are they actually heating the particles? What is next on the timeline for you as to information coming back from the probe? A few very exciting things. We have all the data back from the first orbit. Um, we have had a second encounter with the sun. 
and we downloaded what we call our survey from the orbit. And actually, this afternoon, we're contacting the spacecraft, and we're, we're requesting the playback of certain periods um, at like our full resolution. So we have the ability to kind of zoom in on periods of interest and, and play back uh, even faster uh, data uh, if you see something interesting fly by. We're racing right now to do two things. In November or so, the data from the first two encounters are going to go public. So that'll be the first time like the whole world gets to see the data. And at that moment, like it'll all be documented, it'll all be online. Hopefully the entire community is just going to go to town uh, trying to do science uh, with Solar Probe. So in parallel to figuring out uh, the, our data analysis and getting all those files ready for the community and setting up workshops to teach people how to look at the data, um, we're also trying to write up some interesting things we found from those first two encounters. Um, and there's a couple reasons to do that. Obviously, um, one of the reasons you dedicate a decade of your life to building these instruments is you get to look at things first. Uh, so that's kind of satisfying. <laughs> so hopefully, you know, there's some, we call it low hanging fruit. You know, there's some obvious surprises uh, that we can write up. Uh, the other reason to do it though is to showcase to the community the quality of the data. So we don't just want to write a bunch of papers. We want to show people just how amazing the observations are. So hopefully they drop what they're doing and they get involved in Solar Probe and hopefully we'll have thousands of people looking at the uh, observations in a couple of years. Um, I, I will tell you there, there have been some really interesting results, uh, uh, some of it unexpected, some of it nicely related to what we've been talking about today um, that we're rushing to write up right now. Can you um, give us a hint as to what those might tell us? Well, I guess I'll say there's a lot of really interesting stuff happening that uh, we, we didn't think would be this obvious. Uh, and so I, I can tell you, even from these first couple orbits, which we always kind of dismissed as like commissioning, you know, we're only at 35 solar radii, we're so far away, you know, it's, we probably won't get that much out of it. Uh, we're already, I think, going to um, rewrite some of the textbooks on, on how the Krona and the solar wind uh, behave. It's a surprise to you, isn't it? It's a surprise to the me. The idea yeah. that you guys have been able to glean so much this early in Parker Solar Probe's itinerary yes and and i think i draw two things from that one uh i really the the instrument performance is really phenomenal and uh we we had a our first um project-wide workshop this uh this week uh that we hosted here at the university of michigan uh and a lot of nasa folks were there and people from the team and a lot of people remarked on just how good the observations were uh so that's that's one part of it is things the measurements are really high quality um, and so, you know, regardless of where we were, that's going to provide useful, uh, it's going to let us do really interesting science. Uh, but also I think, um, you know, even though our closest approach at the end of the mission is going to be at nine or 10 solar radii, turns out 35 solar radii is perfectly fascinating and new compared to anything that's ever been done uh, historically. So if we're happy now, we're going to be ecstatic. really ecstatic in, in like five years. Uh, so these will be really beautiful uh, quality data. Um, and the other thing I am very happy to say is uh, there was obviously a lot of hand-wringing and nervousness about the solar probe cup and the temperatures. And I'm happy to say that it's actually running a lot cooler than predicted, um, especially the electronics. Um, so, you know, we'd always been concerned uh, that it might, like things might eventually get too hot for the cup to operate. Um, it looks like that'll be a non-issue. So it'll operate throughout uh, the encounters, which is uh, very good. We are, the total Parker Solar Probe mission life is? The primary phase E, which is like the prime science operations phase, um, I think runs out to 2025. So if we're having this conversation in 2025, what are you hoping that Parker Solar Probe's accomplished at that point? Well, I'm hoping we've crossed below the Alphane point figured out what uh, is heating the solar wind, figured out what the different source regions are on the sun that form different types of solar wind, um, and seen some solar eruptions that produce radiation that let us actually figure out where the uh, radiation is produced. I mean, we're, we're literally looking at, just within our team, maybe 30 or 40 papers on these first uh, results. And... Uh, 
you know, it wouldn't surprise me if at least twice as many papers get put out by the whole uh, project. And that's just these first two uh, first two orbits. Got your work cut and out. And the for internal you. team. Yeah, absolutely. Makes me wonder what you're doing wasting time here. I know. Do you have anything better to do? Oh, I was going to go see the Avengers, but now I, I don't know if I can get to the theater in you time. You're like four weeks since it came out. I know. It's sad. All right. Professor Casper, thank you for joining us for the day's discussion on Parker Solar Probe. My pleasure. I'm hoping we'll be able to catch up with you maybe again. Absolutely. Good deal. We'll see you then. Thanks for listening. One more thing before you go. Please subscribe to Reengineering Radio from the University of Michigan College of Engineering and review us wherever you listen to podcasts. See you next month. Thank you.